Did you all have a good Thanksgiving? Yeah? How many of you are still pretty full from Thursday? Oh, man. It was a good day. I love Thanksgiving. My cowboys didn't do all that well, but it's okay. I have hope, right, this morning. That's our word, hope. All you Buckeyes fans, you're feeling the same way this morning. What in the world? Goodness sakes, what a pathetic display of football yesterday. Goodness. Come on. Yes, I did. I did watch the game on my phone. Yes. But we have hope. And today, we have no notes for our message. How about that? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, activate. Holy, that's right. That's exactly right. I'm not doing the dance. Listen, if they don't want to see my or hear my jokes, they're not seeing any of my dancing, that's for sure. Not going to happen. Jake, you come up here. You show them some dance moves. No, you're not. Whatever. Oh, I bet Art, I bet Art was doing some dancing yesterday. He's out there somewhere. I think he's on. Oh, there he is. He's right there. Oh, man. <laughs> <There's the laughs> mm. A revelation of Jesus revolutionizes everything. Listen. Jesus is everything. You don't have to look anywhere else. When you find him, when you encounter him, that's it. You're done. Stick a fork in you. You're done. There are times when those who have known Jesus a while may feel as though there's nothing else left to experience. Jesus is always wanting to pour more. There's always more. You never arrive, I can never arrive at the threshold of the ultimate experience, the ultimate level of maturity or whatever it is, the ultimate encounter and that's as good as it gets. It's all downhill from there. That is not a part of the kingdom experience in Christ. That's not a part of our new life in Jesus. When you encounter Jesus, listen, when you encounter Jesus, you don't just become a better version of what you were before. You become transformed into an entirely new being. Old things have passed away. All things are new. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation, not just a better version of what you were before you made the decision. You're different. You've changed completely inside and out. And that's just the beginning. That's just the tip of the iceberg. There is so much more he has in store for you. But he doesn't just drop it in your lap. He 
he wants you to encounter him. He wants you to experience a new revelation of his love, a new revelation of his mercy, a new revelation of his grace. Every day, every hour, every minute, you can experience a new side of his face. Do you want that? Do I want that? Am I willing to pursue and just completely surrender everything to the lordship of Jesus? There's one thing about Jesus being our savior, but when he becomes your Lord, that's when you step into something new. That's when the adventure really begins. And you begin to discover who Jesus is. And living in the fullness of what he came to offer. John chapter 1. It's going to be on the screens. You can turn there if you want. I'm going to be reading out of the Passion Translation. He has a word for you today. I believe every person in this room, there is something the Holy Spirit wants to deposit within your spirit. So right now, that's what I want you to do. I just want you to hold out your hands like this, like you're receiving a gift. Remember, you don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. You just have to receive. Ask and you will receive. Holy Spirit right now. We make ourselves available to you. We are open. Nothing is hidden. Speak to us. Encounter us. We hold nothing back from you. We receive in Jesus' name. John chapter 1. In the very beginning, the living expression was already there. It's a unique way of describing Jesus. The word was there. He was with God. Jesus is the divine self-expression of all that God is, all that he contains and reveals in incarnated flesh. Just as we express ourselves in words, God has perfectly expressed himself in Christ. We express ourselves in words. Well, Jesus is the very word of God in flesh. God has perfectly expressed himself. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So he is the perfect reflection, right? He is the visible image of the invisible God. He is the living expression of the fullness of all that God is in flesh, wrapped up. That should blow our minds. That God himself wrapped skin onto himself and came for us. The living expression was with God, yet fully God. They were together face to face in the very beginning. And through his creative inspiration, the living expression made all things. For nothing has existence apart from him. Life came into being because of him. For his life is the light for all humanity. And the living expression is the light that bursts through the gloom. The light that darkness could not diminish. Amen. Then suddenly a man appeared who was sent from God, a messenger named John. For he came to be a witness to point the way to the light of life. 
and to help everyone believe. John was not that light, but he came to show who is. For he was merely a messenger to speak the truth about the light. For the light of truth was about to come into the world and shine upon everyone. He entered into the very world he created, yet the world was unaware. He came to the very people he created, to those who should have recognized him, but they did not receive him. Listen, but those who embraced him and took hold of his name were given authority to become children of God. We need to read that again. But those who embraced him and took hold of his name were given authority to become children of God. Given the right to become sons and daughters. Jesus said, those who become like children will enter the kingdom. The mark of maturity in the life of a believer is becoming more childlike. The mark of maturity in the life of a believer is becoming more childlike. Not childish. Childlike wonder. Faith. Purity. That's who we are to become. That's timed perfectly. You can let it keep ringing. That's fine. It goes, goes well. Thank you, Jesus. Sometimes we become too big for our britches. And we think, oh, I got to have it all together and I got to be mature and I can't allow the wonder and the joy in Jesus to really to take over. Become like a child. Michael Koulianos, he says, becoming less childlike is not maturity, it's backsliding. I never want to lose my wonder of Jesus. I never want to lose the awe that I have when I look into his face. Every day, every time I encounter him. He blows my mind. His glory blows me away. We can't lose the wonder. We can't lose our childlikeness to just believe it because he said it. When I tell my girls something, they believe it because their, their daddy said it. And I've never given them a reason to doubt. Okay, but maybe that's not entirely true. But they know that if mommy and daddy tell them something, they can trust us. They don't have any hesitancy to know whether or not we're going to come through on what we've promised. That is what the Lord is looking for in our lives. That we become like a child in the fact that if he said it, I don't care what anyone else says. My daddy told me this, so I'm going to believe it and stand on it and move in it. That's becoming more like a child. That every morning, the anticipation and the joy of what we can encounter today in Jesus is just like Christmas morning for a five-year-old. The wonder 
How many of you, you know it's, it's actually, at least for us and our family it, and our girls, it's not really even about what the gift is. It's more about the anticipation of what the gift is. That's what I love. What, what can we do today, Jesus? What do you have for me today? What do you want me to see? What do you want me to encounter? I can't, I'm giddy. Like, I can't wait to know. I can't wait to encounter more of you. Verse 13, he was not born by the joining of human parents or from natural means or by man's desire, but he was born of God. And so the living expression became a man and lived among us. And we gazed upon the splendor of his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, overflowing with tender mercy and truth. He, John taught the truth about him when he announced to people, he's the one. Set your hearts on him. I told you he would come after me, even though he ranks far above me. For he existed before I was even born. And now, out of the fullness, out of his fullness, we are fulfilled. Amen? Out of his fullness, we are fulfilled. You don't have to look anywhere else to find fulfillment, to find satisfaction, to find joy, to find purpose. He is it. He's everything. There's nothing better. Jesus is everything. And when we live our lives consumed by his presence, consumed by the affirmation of his gaze on me, that I'm his son, that I'm forgiven, that I've been set free, that I've been sanctified and cleansed and made holy, empowered by his Holy Spirit and filled with his glory. That's all scripture, by the way. It's who you are in Christ. When we live in that knowledge, everything else comes alive. Everything else is different. Everything else changes. Because now we're seeing through his eyes. We're seeing through his Holy Spirit. And life has changed forever. And now out of his fullness, we are fulfilled. And from him, we receive grace heaped upon more grace. Moses gave us the law, but Jesus, the anointed one, unveils truth wrapped in tender mercy. Why do we need mercy and truth? Because truth would destroy us without the mercy of God. No one has ever gazed upon the fullness of God's splendor except the uniquely beloved son who is cherished by the father and held close to his heart. Now he has unfolded to us the full explanation of who God really is. Jesus said, I only do what I see my father doing. I only say what I hear my father saying. And if you've seen me, you have seen the father A revelation of Jesus revolutionizes everything else in your life. He takes over. The shepherds abiding in the field had an encounter with an angel. They told them that today in the town of David, a Savior has been born. He's Christ the Lord. And they gave them a sign. You'll find him wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. And the angels worshiped and praised God. And when the angels had left, they gone into heaven. The shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. 
When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which was just as they had been told. A revelation of Jesus requires a response. But it's not a response that we have to work up to ourselves. It was a natural response when the shepherds had encountered Jesus. They had a revelation of the Christ. They went and told everybody. They couldn't keep it to themselves. They were so overwhelmed. It was natural for them. They went and told everyone, and everyone who heard, remember, these were lowly shepherds. They weren't high class. They weren't people of authority or influence. But yet the message that they carried contained within it the hope, the joy, the peace that all the world had been waiting for. When we have a revelation of Jesus, it is impossible to keep it to ourselves. That doesn't mean you're going to stand on a stage with a microphone and tell hundreds or thousands of people. But you have to tell somebody. Just like the shepherds. They, had, they didn't have to go through, you know, an evangelism class to know this news is too good to keep to ourselves. And then they returned to their fields. What did they do? They were praising God and they were worshiping him. Their hearts had to respond to the revelation they had received in Jesus. Matthew chapter 2. The wise men, the magi. They had followed a star that they had seen in the sky. They went to King Herod. They told them about what they had witnessed. And... Herod then called his, you know, philosophers to him and said, where is the baby to be born? What's happening? They, they tell him of the prophecy. Herod then called the Magi secretly back to himself and said, you go and find the baby Jesus and then tell me where he is so that I can worship him as well. It was not his intention. We know that. He wanted to kill Jesus. After they had heard the king, this is Matthew 2 verse 9. They went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and incense and myrrh. The wise men who were... Wealthy priests is who they were. Men of great influence. You see, Jesus, your socioeconomic status means nothing when it comes to being used of God. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter what your possessions, your rank in society, none of it matters. Your title, it doesn't matter. Lowly shepherds. Wealthy priests, both had a revelation and an encounter with Jesus. And these men, these priests, hit their knees. They bowed low to the ground in wonder and in awe of what they, they knew what they beheld. And their natural response was to bow low in worship and then to offer what they had. When we have a revelation of Jesus, we can't help but give everything we possess to him and say, Lord, it is yours. Everything I own, everything I possess, everything I want, it's you. Take it all. Because a revelation of Jesus revolutionizes everything, changes 
everything. We're never the same. What we have doesn't belong to us anymore. And the world needs to know it. Amen. Mm. I just feel real relaxed. Your voice, there's something, something in your voice. You guys okay? <laughs> Holy Spirit in your voice this morning is just like, okay, it's okay. Slow down. Take a deep breath. Receive from me alone. Amen. In Revelation 4.11, it says, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Are you an accident? Oh, I'm going to say that again because that is hitting some ears that have heard that said before about them. Are you an accident? You see, the word of God says that he created everything. He knows and it is his will that you exist. Amen? It's so good. Let's just remember that you were born for such a time as this. No matter how old you are, no matter how young you are, you have a purpose. He has a purpose for you. And it's to fix your eyes on Jesus and everything else will fall into place, church. This whole word, the revelation of Jesus causes a revolution. How many of you have been revolutionized by Jesus Christ? Amen. Your life is not the same. Your, your heart is not the same. Your thought process is not the same. You are a different person. Thank you, Jesus. A revelation of who? Let me be clear. It's not a revelation of Travis and Leslie. It's not a revelation of, of, of uh, Stephen Furtick. It's not a revelation of an, a man. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ, the Lord himself, who came as a man. That revolutionizes a heart and a life. And the Holy Spirit, when he comes into you, he is Christ in you. The Holy Spirit is Christ in you, the hope of, oh man, there's that word hope again. Ooh. We were preparing this message this week, and man, oh man, I just feel his presence is just so gentle this morning. And I don't want to interrupt that. He's just here with you, and he, he's showing you a new side of his glory. And you may, you may even feel the point of, like, I haven't felt this free from anxiety in a long time. I haven't felt the freedom from stress in a long time in this moment. I don't want to interrupt that. We're not in a hurry. Y'all are like, uh-huh, we know. Lunchtime's in 15 minutes. <laughs> but we're not in a hurry. So we were spending time with Jesus this week, and, and we were reading a devotion that's called Mornings and Evenings with him. And I read this devotion, and it just, oh, boy. I told him, I said, this is Sunday. So can I read it to you? Do you mind? Well, if you don't, I'm still doing it anyways. <sighs> just picture yourself holding a warm cup of coffee and a blankie. <laughs> It's time for a revolution in our vision. <laughs> when prophets tell us, your vision is too small, many of us think the antidote is to increase whatever numbers we're expecting. For example, if we're expecting 10 new converts, let's change it to 100. If we're praying for cities, let's pray instead for nations. With such responses, we're missing the sharp edge of the frequently repeated word. Increasing the numbers is not necessarily a sign of a larger vision from God. Smack in the forehead. Vision starts with identity. <laughs> 
intimacy, identity, increase. Vision starts with your identity. It starts here. And then the purpose follows. Through a revolution of our identity, we can think with divine purpose. Such a change begins with a revelation of who? Come on. Such a change begins where? With a revelation of Jesus, not with striving, not with what I can produce, not with my degree, not with my career, not with my work, not with my knowledge, not with my strength, not with my ability, not with my goodness. Nope. A revolution in my identity to become more like Christ starts with a revelation of Jesus Christ himself. And my identity then will be like we've been saying, this whole service will be set into motion. And I will walk as a son. I will walk as a daughter. Amen? Ooh. Such a revelation <sighs> begins with him. We are often more convinced of our unworthiness than we are of his worth. We fixate on ourselves. I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. I can't do it. I don't have what it takes. And then we, we, we forget that Jesus is literally everything. Everything. And him in us. Oh, I love the verse. That same power that what? Raised Christ from the dead lives in me. We fixate on our unworthiness instead of his worth. Our inability takes on greater focus than does his ability. Mm. How many of you have not done something that Jesus has prompted you to do because you didn't feel you were able? Be honest. How many of you have not done something Jesus has prompted you to do because you did not feel able? I think we can all raise our hands. We fixate on that instead of his ability in us. He says, I have strengthened you. I have called you. I have ordained you. I have created you. I have put my life inside of you. Now be obedient. Stop fixating on what we think we can and cannot do. But the same one who called fearful Gideon a valiant warrior and unstable Peter a rock, come on has called us the body of his beloved son on earth. Think about that phrase right there. The same God who called Gideon a valiant warrior, who was a fearful man. The same God who said, Peter, you are my rock. On this rock, I will build my church. Come on. This, he looks at you and says, you are are my son's body on earth. Jesus is not dead. He is surely alive. Where is he alive? In you and me. A revelation that we are the living, active body of Christ. Means something. See, it goes on to say that means that the impossible is possible because of a revelation of Jesus. Those who walk in arrogance because of how they see themselves in Christ don't really see it at all. When we see who he is, what he has done on our behalf, and who he says we are, there is only one possible response. Worship. With a humble heart. Amen? Would you stand with me? This Christmas season, I pray that we don't fixate on things. We don't fixate on events. We don't fixate on stress. Come on. But that we fixate on Jesus Christ, our Lord. Because a revelation of him revolutionizes our lives. I want to say it again. What changes me? Jesus. It means taking time and not being in a hurry. 
It means right now, in this moment, nothing else matters. But to just fix our eyes on him. Can you close your eyes with me? I don't want you looking at me right now. You came as a baby. (laughs) And what they thought you were going to come as was a king to revolutionize the Roman government, but instead you came to revolutionize the human heart. (laughs) You came to set us right. You came to restore what was lost, what was stolen, what is broken. You came to set us free from sin. You came to deliver us from every bondage. You came to set men into the right place, into the heart of the Father. You came to deliver us and make us new. You came to call us your sons and your daughters. You came to move on our behalf. You came to deliver. Come on. Oh, there's so much. And during this time, Lord, we want to just be in your presence and receive whatever you have for us, Jesus. A new side of your face. Glory. Hope. Courage. Clarity of vision. That we wouldn't focus on what men focus on. We wouldn't focus on achievements. We wouldn't focus on numbers. We wouldn't focus on whatever we're looking at. But we would look at you. (laughs) Because where you are is everything we need. (laughs) An abundance and increase in glory and love. You are so good. If you have your communion cup, would you prepare your communion cup with me this morning? If you need one, just raise your hand. There'll be some guys walking around with the with the the plate. Oh, soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's a light for I look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. And turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Through death into life everlasting, he passed and we followed in there. Listen. Over us sin no more has dominion, for more than conquerors we are. So turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace. And his word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. And go to a world that is dying. His perfect salvation to tell. 
So turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Guys, I've <laughs> I have held back my emotions all morning <laughs> because Jesus is so good. And I can't help it and I'm not apologizing. I <laughs> just <laughs> he's so good. <laughs> And he's so present in this room. <laughs> and as we prepared this message for you this morning, it was the presence of Jesus that was the message. It's not our words. It's not the fancy sermon that we crafted. It's Jesus. He is everything. He is everything. And in this moment, we celebrate the life <laughs> that he has birthed in us. I think about Brooke and Brock and Tyler and how when they gave their life to Jesus, they were telling everyone, just like the shepherds, <laughs> they tell everyone that when we have an encounter with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, I pray that after today you go out and you tell everyone about him. Not because you have to. Not because you're forced to. Not because you're required to. But because of how good he is. Because of the, the, the change that has happened in you as you encounter him, this Christmas season is going to be a new encounter for you. Jesus is here. He has so much for you that I can't even put into words. And as we celebrate the table of the Lord, the fulfillment, I need a tissue. Okay. That's not big enough. Oh, yes, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Mama. It's so cool that we get to do all of this in one day. So we get to celebrate his birth. We get to celebrate and honor his death and resurrection. And then we get to see it manifest in the lives of the believers. In one wall in one fell swoop. Isn't that a good day? And so I want to just put this on the table one more time. Jesus is here. And he loves you. And if you've never given your life to him, this is your time. This is your moment. If you've never taken communion before, this isn't something you do lightheartedly and just, oh, I'll just drink the cup and take the bread. This is to honor Christ's body and his blood and the, and the work he's doing in you. And I want to invite you to the table. I want to give you the cup. I want to give you the bread. I want you to know that you are worthy because he is worthy. You are worth it because he is, he is giving you everything. He calls you worthy. Amen? So if you're in the house this morning and you want to give your life to Jesus, I just want to take that moment and honor you, celebrate you, cheer you on in Christ, and then we'll baptize you in water, okay? <laughs> we got it all today. So right now, if that is you, right now, confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Jesus, you are Lord. You are good. You have saved me. You have redeemed me. Forgive me of my sin. Thank you for freeing me from my sin. I confess that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords of my heart. And that God raised you up out of that grave for my life. You came back to life so that I could come back to life. I receive your salvation today. 
Amen? If that's you, we are cheering you on. Angels in heaven are going nuts right now. And we are so excited for what Jesus is doing in your heart. And if you're brave enough, you can raise your hand and say, that's me. That's me. That public confession of faith. Sweet. You see, when we lead others to Jesus, it's very, very simple. Amen? It is not complicated. It is not hard. Seize the moment. He is the answer. As they ate, I wonder what they had for dinner that night. Steak. Bradley said they have steak. Park Street pizza. Park Street. <laughs> Chicken Alfredo. Mmm, yes, Lord. I didn't hear what you said. Pot roast. <laughs> a bag of chips. I think it was more than a bag of chips. But for some of you, that is the answer. Right, Danielle? <laughs> Glory to God. Just like this. They were sitting around the table, and you can imagine whatever food you want to on the table. And they were feasting together, and Jesus knew what was about to come. He wanted to show them before they even saw it. He wanted to reveal the plan, and even then they still didn't get it, but they began to understand that what Jesus really came to do was lay his life down to revolutionize our lives and theirs. And so they, they were at the table, and as they ate, Jesus took the bread and blessed it. We take the bread, Lord, and we thank you, and we bless this bread. We thank you for the bread of life that is your son. We thank you that this bread represents his body. And we bless this as we take and we take a part of him into ourselves. We thank you for the redemption of our bodies. We thank you for the redemption of our minds, our souls, our spirits because of his body. We praise you. He tore it and he gave it to his disciples. He said to them, receive this, it's my body. Would you eat with me today? And then he took the cup of grape juice not what it says. It says wine. <laughs> he took the cup. Mm. He said, this is my blood. And what they didn't know was that he was going to be beaten to the point of unrecognizableness, that he was going to be crushed his head, the crown of thorns. What they didn't understand was that blood that was he was referring to had to be spilled in order for the new covenant to be established. And I am thankful for the blood of Jesus. Then taking the cup of wine and giving praises to the Father, he declared the new covenant with them. Oh, my. Do you know that this moment, the declaration of the new covenant with his disciples was the fulfillment of every prophetic word in the Old Testament? In this moment, he said the Old Testament into the New Testament. He said the Old Covenant into the New Covenant so that it all applies to us. It is all through him that we fulfill the law of Christ. And as each of them drank from the cup, he said, to them, this is my blood, which seals, come on somebody, it's sealed, it's sealed, it's sealed, it seals the new covenant, the new promises that he has for you, it's, it's not a maybe, it's not a might, it's a sealed work, it's a finished work, he sealed it, 
This is my body, which blood, which seals the new covenant poured out for many. I tell you the truth. I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day comes when we drink it together in the kingdom realm of my father. I will not take, partake in this again until we are in heaven together. So guess what? Not only do we get to celebrate now, but that he's coming back. He's coming back. I pray that you are excited about his coming. And, and oh boy, okay, that's another sermon. Okay, fix. Whoo, excited. It's not a disappointing fantasy. His blood was shed to set us into eternity. So we thank you, Jesus, for the blood. We thank you for laying your life down for our lives. We thank you for going to the cross and fulfilling every law, fulfilling every commandment, fulfilling every word, every jot and every tittle. You did it all. And we praise you and we thank you for your blood, the blood that finished it. And that continues to flow in our veins and continues to pour life into us. And we praise you that because of your blood, by your stripes, we are healed. Because of your blood, we are set free. You are free. You are free. You are free. It is done. It is sealed. We praise you, Jesus, and we receive today. Let's drink together. Praise God. Let's do it one more time. Turn. Let's sing it one more time. Turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. As Bradley says, you are Jesus in a Tanya suit. You are Jesus in an Emily suit, and a Kyle suit, and an Ashley suit. You are Jesus wherever you go. Don't forget to keep your eyes fixed on the one who keeps you above the waves. Jesus Christ. A revelation of Jesus revolutionizes our lives. We love you so much. Have an amazing first week of December. We pray a blessing over you. Go in his love. Amen. We love you guys.